All right, ladies and gentlemen, you are locked on Falcons. I'm your host, Aaron Freeman. And today we are looking at players like Caleb McGarry and Auden Tate and why those guys may be a little bit on the bubble entering training camp, but why also they have breakout potential this year alongside players like Anthony Rush and Jermaine Effetti. You are locked on Falcons, your daily Atlanta Falcons podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. So guys, you know me, I'm Aaron Freeman, been covering the Falcons for many years, formerly at falcfans.com. RIP still going strong on Twitter at Falk fans. And of course, the host of this illustrious Locked On Falcons podcast, your daily Atlanta Falcons podcast, part of the Locked On Sports Atlanta podcast family. And today's episode of Locked On Falcons is brought to you by Better Line. Better Line has you covered this season with more props, odds, and contests and lines than ever before. Better Line, where the game starts. So we thank everyone that makes Locked on Falcons their first listen each and every day. Of course, Locked on Falcons is free and available Monday through Friday on your preferred podcast platform, whether that's Apple, Odyssey, Google, or Spotify. And you can also check out Locked on Falcons on YouTube. Make sure you subscribe to Locked on Falcons on YouTube. Hit that bell, hit that like, and you will get the video version of the podcast the night before the audio drops. So today we're kind of talking about breakout and bubble players, and it's not necessarily too many players that are like destined to get cut when we talk about bubble guys, but guys are sort of intercamp that may not be on the shores of footing despite certain expectations among fans or media or, or whatever the case may be. We'll be talking about Kayla McGarry, Jermaine Fetty. We'll talk about Auden Tate, Brian Edwards. And of course we'll be talking about Anthony rush and why those guys maybe more leaning towards the bubble side or more leaning towards breakout potential. Now let's start things off talking about uh, Kayla McGarry and the Falcons uh, offensive lineman, particularly that battle at that right tackle position uh, where we talked about this a little bit at the end of June in the offensive line training camp preview, where we broke down that position group and sort of talked about how guys like Kayla McGarry and Matt Hennessy may not necessarily be entering the summer as the sort of locks that you would expect them to be, given that their expectations that they are the incumbent starters at the center and right tackle uh, position. Now, and when it comes to the right tackle position that we'll be focusing on today, I do think Kayla McGarry um, alongside Jermaine Effetti, again, two guys that aren't necessarily locks, but two guys that I think will probably wind up making the roster. But there is a chance that the Falcons could decide to release uh, one of those guys, whoever loses the competition for that starting right tackle position, largely due to the fact that Kayla McGarry and Jermaine Effetti don't have quite the positional flexibility that you typically expect in a backup offensive lineman with Kayla McGarry having spent his entirety of his NFL as well as his college career playing right tackle. Jermaine Effetti spending the entirety of his NFL and college career playing on the right side, either at right guard or right tackle in the NFL. And particularly when you're looking for depth at the position, that's fine when you're a starter, if you only play one position and if you play that position well, no one's going to care. But when it comes to depth, you want that positional flexibility because we know injuries do occur uh, over the course of a season and you have to sort of insert guys into the lineup. And in the event of, say, let's say Jake Matthews tweaks an ankle, who goes in for him? Are you putting Kayla McGarry, you putting Jermaine Effetti, who have almost no experience playing on the left side uh, in that uh, left tackle spot where they could struggle? Or are you looking for somebody else to truly be that swing tackle in the event of an injury? The guy that has that positional flexibility to play both left and right tackle. Now, if you listen to last week's episode where I broke down my um, projected 53-man roster, I essentially had Rick Leonard uh, in that backup swing tackle position. And The reasons why I projected Rick Leonard to win that spot in a competition, presumably with Elijah Wilkinson, as well as undrafted free agent out of Boston College, Tyler Rabel. There's four main reasons why I picked Rick Leonard over those guys. The first one, just for the sake of being different. Uh, The other second one was 
I do imagine Wilkinson will get a lot of reps more as a guard and potentially be the the front runner to be pushing Jalen Mayfield at that left guard position uh, this summer. And so every snap he's getting at left guard is a snap that he's not getting at left tackle where he can really prove that positional flexibility uh, at the, as that swing tackle. The other factor is that when the Saints drafted Rick Leonard back in 2018 in the fourth round, he was expected to be this sort of multi-year project. And now that we're four years later, you would expect his, you know, projection, his potential to start to be delivered at this point in time. The reason for that was because Leonard played defensive line for his first two years at Florida State before switching to the offensive line. And then the fourth reason is because those Saints ties mean that Rick Leonard is a Terry Fontenot guy, while Elijah Wilkinson, due to his ties with the Chicago Bears last year, is a Ryan Pace guy. And I imagine that the war between Ryan Pace and Terry Fontenot uh, to sort of hold the reins of this front office will sort of boil down to this competition. I think Terry may win it in the end with Rick Leonard winning that potential. But getting back to Kayla McGarry and Jermaine Effetti, you know, we talk about these guys not necessarily being on the firmest footing, that you could see a scenario where the loser of this competition could be cut because they lack that positional flexibility. And if a guy like a Rick Leonard or Elijah Wilkinson uh, emerges that swing tackle, then the Falcons could be justified in moving on from one of those guys. Um, but I think this year also represents breakout potential for both of these guys. McGarry's in a contract year, Fetty's on a one-year contract, and both of those guys, because of their limited positional flexibility, are essentially, you know, if they get other opportunities, whether that's in Atlanta in the future or elsewhere, it's most likely going to be at right tackle. And so these are two guys that really need to have a good 2022 in order to facilitate further opportunities in their NFL careers, just because nobody's going to really sign these guys to be swing tackles, given that lack of positional flexibility that we already broke down. Now, in this competition, it's going to be interesting because you can sort of say where the Falcons fall on this spectrum between Kayla McGarry and Jermaine Effetti kind of will tell you what kind of identity this team is looking for because McGarry is more of the proven run blocker while Fetty is the more proven and reliable pass protector. Uh, where if you look at Kayla McGarry's last eight games, uh, according to PFF last year, he graded out as one of the top five run blocking offensive tackles in the NFL. Now, you can certainly dispute whether those grades were fair, but he graded out, at least according to them, as a 94th percentile uh, run blocker at that tackle position over those final eight games of the season. You compare that to K uh, Jermaine Effetti and his pass protection skills. He started 14 games over the last two seasons for the Bears at that right tackle position. His pass protection grades, according to PFF, were like, I think, 48th and 52nd percentile. So you can basically say he's a league average pass protector, which is a big improvement from what Caleb McGarry has often been, uh, where he's been, you know, in the teens and in, in, in single digits in terms of percentiles as a pass protector at various points over the last two seasons. Uh, however, uh, Jermaine Effetti in terms is similarly grades out poorly as a run blocker in like the 20th percentile, 30th percentile type of player these last couple of years. So we'll see where the Falcons sort of fall on that spectrum. You know, I think what's going to be interesting this season, whoever wins that competition is not going to have an easy job uh, to do this year. And so if that player is to rise up, as it were, and overcome some of the players that they're going to face primarily lined up at the right tackle position, guys that primarily line up on the left side of the defensive line as pass rushers, you got Cam Jordan week one, you got Leonard Floyd week two, Jadavion Clowney in week four with the Browns, Shaq Barrett in week five, Nick Bosa week six, Sam Hubbard week seven, you got Brian Burns in week eight, Joey Bosa later in the season, Chase Young, TJ Watt, uh, et cetera, as the guys that will be bringing pressure. And so it wouldn't shock me uh, if the person who winds up starting the season as the right tackle doesn't necessarily finish the season because particularly the guy who has to go through that murderer's row in the first half of the season, uh, you know, is going to have a tough slate. So that's part of the reason why I do still, despite talking about McGarry and Nefeti not necessarily being locks to make the roster, I do expect the Falcons to keep both of those guys just to have one of those guys, particularly if it's a close competition this summer, as an insurance option uh, later in the season. Now, if one player clearly is better than the other, then you could easily see the Falcons uh, moving on from that backup who loses that competition and potentially bringing in somebody who's a better option or whether a Rick Leonard or Elijah Wilkins or Tyler Vrabel emerges in that situation. So I think the offensive line is going to be one of those interesting positions um, to monitor as this training camp unfolds and the preseason unfolds. And we talked about this uh, last week on Friday's episode with Jarvis Davis 
listeners of the ATL Day Ones podcast. Uh, but one of the things that I talked about this back in June as well is, you know, I'm interested to see if the Falcons kind of blow up this offensive line room. Like Arthur Smith is walking down the hallway, looks into the offensive line room, you know, takes her grenade pulls that pin, throws it in a room, close the door and just, you know, boom, and then see what shakes out. Uh, and so like, I'm open for that as grisly as that metaphor is uh, like, I'm open for the Falcons to just kind of shake things completely up uh, on this offensive line. Cause we saw what this starting five that the Falcons seemingly are running it back with did last year. It was not impressive. It was one of the worst offensive lines in the league this year. So might as well shake things up and see, you know, if two or three new starters, uh, including at that right tackle position, position lead to better results this season. Uh, and, you know, speaking of trench play, we'll sort of switch sides and talk a little bit about the defensive lineman in Anthony Rush, who's not really on the bubble, but does have breakout potential as he was quick to tell me personally on Twitter. And we'll get into that as we continue uh, today's Locked on Falcons episode, guys. But before we get there, I want to tell you about the number one source for all your sports betting needs and info. Whether you're looking for a plot podcast, the latest odds, contests, or player props, you name it, BetOnline has it all. Of course, currently you can bet on Major League Baseball, but you can also bet on any variety of sports, whether it be football, basketball, hockey, UFC, boxing, esports, Vegas casino games. I'm looking at some of these game odds for the Falcons. They're five and a half point favorites. It, uh, underdogs, I'm sorry, in week one against the New Orleans Saints, but I'm looking at them. How are they five point underdogs against the Seahawks in week three? That's one of the most winnable games. So I'm looking at maybe putting some money down now on those odds to for the Falcons to cover that before that line moves significantly over the next couple of weeks as we get geared up for the regular season. And you can too by heading over to betonline.net to check out more of the trends in action. Betonline, where the game starts. So, guys, I thank you again for making Locked On Falcons your first listen each and every day. Uh, and um, always make sure you subscribe to Locked On Falcons on your preferred podcast platform. But let's jump into the conversation surrounding Anthony Rush. And it was funny. I can't remember. I think it was Wednesday or Thursday's episode where we did a QA. and a uh, and we talked a little bit about Eddie Goldman's retirement. And one listener asked me, have you ever had instances where a player chirped back on you on Twitter? And I list three incidents where Desmond Southworth, Donovan Smith and Edo Smith, uh, you know, took um, umbrage with uh, some things I said on Twitter. And, you know, within a few minutes of me recording that episode on that day, I had a fourth player. And that was none other than Anthony Rush uh, sort of being upset with. Uh, I guess a tweet I had about Eddie Goldman retiring and basically me saying, you know, the, the, for the handful of fans uh, that had mentioned that Eddie, uh, that Anthony Rush would start over Eddie Goldman, uh, they wound up being right in the end. And sort of Anthony Rush took that seemingly personally as, you know, a shot at him, which I didn't necessarily mean it as that. But I, I think most people understood with the exception of two fans that were uh you know mentioned it to me on twitter and on the youtube comments i think most people assumed that eddie goldman wasn't signed to be the backup behind anthony rush but obviously anthony rush felt a little bit differently on that note and and decided he wanted to uh let me know about that on twitter which is his prerogative but you know anthony rush is an interesting player he's not really a bubble player but he does have sort of breakout potential right he, he did play in 10 games last year but part of the reason why I'm skeptical, not specifically of him, but just the D-line group uh, in, in general um, is because those 10 games that Anthony Rush did play and we did see some positive moments for him, uh, particularly in that second Saints game where the Falcons really did do a great job uh, clamping down uh, the Saints running game. And that was a big reason why the Falcons were able to win that sort of week eight matchup against the Saints. But you know, outside of that, the Falcons run defense did not play particularly well. I think they had a good game against the Panthers in their second matchup after basically getting run rough shot on uh, in that week eight or week nine matchup, whichever week that was. And then coming back in like week 14, whenever they played the Panthers the second time and really clamping down on that run game. Uh, but outside of those two games, that Saints game and that Panthers game, the Falcons run defense was very poor in the 10 games that Anthony Rush uh, did wind up being the team's primary nose tackle over a guy like Tyler Davidson. The Falcons gave up an average of 135 yards in those 10 games, which would have been bottom five in the NFL uh, during that stretch of the season. And it's not 
solely on Anthony Rush as why that was, but I look at the unit as a whole and you saw, you know, veterans like Tyler Davidson and Mike Pinnell and Jonathan Ballard depart this offseason. The Falcons choosing not to sign those guys. And then they didn't really sign anybody to replace those guys, right? Uh, the only player they really added was Vincent Taylor. Now, you could certainly make the an easy argument that Davidson, Pinnell, and, and Ballard last season and their performances were essentially replacement level players. But I think you could also say similar things about Anthony Rush, Taquan Graham, and Marlon Davidson, some of the players that the Falcons have retained this season. And so essentially the Falcons with those um, three, four guys that they now have with Vincent Taylor added to the mix, essentially because they haven't added uh, other players on the defensive line, they're kind of expecting those four guys to do something that seven guys couldn't necessarily do collectively. And I, I think it's fair to be skeptical of that. But you know, that's been one of the reasons why over the last several months I've been expecting the Falcons to sign players like Eddie Goldman, as well as now that Eddie Goldman's retiring, why I expect the Falcons to continue to make roster moves along their defensive line, because it seems it was a weakness last year. It seems thinner than it was a year ago. So, it, you know, just put two and two together. And so you would just assume that there's more moves to be had there. Uh, but you know, we haven't really given Anthony Rush his due in that span of time. So let's do that now. And he has an interesting story that he uh, let me know about on Twitter, uh, sort of talking about how he wasn't invited to the uh, combine, didn't have necessarily a pro day due to his injury uh, and, and has basically been on and off. NFL rosters throughout the three years that he's been in the league, the Falcons represent the seven team he's been on uh, in that span of time. Um, and, you know, prior to this past season with the Falcons, he played about 16 combined games across those first three uh, seasons in the NFL before playing 10 games with the Falcons a year ago. Um, and, you know, I think last year you could make the argument that in the first couple of years that he was in the NFL, like he was a practice squad level player because that's where he primarily where he was spending most of his time with these various other six teams that he had played with. And then last year in those 10 games with the Falcons, he graduated from being a practice squad player to a player uh, that could be a quality backup. And of course, my skepticism is like, I don't know if he's going to be more than that uh, this upcoming season, but obviously Anthony Rush feels a little differently uh, based off of his Twitter handle uh, and, you know, can't be blocked. But uh, he's expecting to sort of graduate from being a backup player to more than that and a potential starter. And so I, th I think it's fair uh, that, you know, given Anthony Rush chirping back at me, we should give him at least some credit uh, for, you know, showing some progress over the course of his team. It's certainly a player that I think can be a contributor on an NFL roster as he showed last year. The questions I have is just whether or not he's going to be a starter. But this summer, when we talk about, you know, not a player on the bubble, but certainly a guy that has breakout potential that if he can show that he's more than that and he's more than a backup level player, that he is actually a legit starting caliber player, then, you know, we could see, you know, some good things happen for the Falcons defensive front, which, again, as I said earlier, is a little bit questionable heading into the summer. We'll see if the Falcons, you know, feel the same way and, and bring in more help uh, in the next couple of days ahead of training camp uh, or at the, in the early days of training camp. Or do they let, you know, the Anthony Rushes of the world get get that opportunity to prove themselves and then maybe wait a little bit before they bring any help. So we'll see how that plays out. But, you know, uh, shout out to Anthony Rush for uh, letting me know. Uh, and so, you know, we'll, we'll give him uh, some credit on today's episode. But uh, we'll continue and wrap up today's sort of breakout bubble player talking about the wide receiver position. Talk about why Auden Tate is a player that I know a lot of people have been hyping up this offseason, but I think he enters training camp on the bubble, but similar to what we talked about with the right tackle position, you know, whether it's Auden Tate, whether it's a Brian Edwards, one of these two guys certainly has breakout potential this upcoming season with the Falcons. And we'll break that down as we continue today's episode. But before we get there, guys, I do want to plug the Locked On Sports Atlanta podcast family, where you can find three shows hosted by four people, A to Z with Mark Zeno, Hitting Hard with John Chuckery, and ATL Day Ones with Jarvis Davis and Tanitra Batiste, breaking down not only the local sports stories, but also national sports stories, all on the same podcast feed, whether you check it out on Apple Odyssey, Google, or Spotify. Of course, you can also check it out on YouTube as well. And if you do check out Locked On Sports Atlanta, on YouTube, you will also be able to check out the Locked On Braves postcast, breaking down every Braves win and loss this upcoming season. And now that we're right on the verge of training camp, I can let you know that the Atlanta Falcons post game postcast will also be on the Locked On Sports Atlanta feed. So 
definitely go ahead and subscribe right now so that each and every Sunday you will be able to get that postcast with me and Jarvis Davis, the co-host of the ATL Day Ones podcast, breaking down every Falcons win and loss. And we'll certainly be trying to do those as well in the preseason ahead of the regular season. So subscribe to Locked On Sports Atlanta on your preferred podcast app, including YouTube. So guys, I also want to tell you about a situation that you are and I are also very familiar with when money can be pretty tight and that can introduce a level of stress into your life, especially when you don't know if you're going to make it to your next paycheck and whether or not uh, unexpected expenses uh, will come up in the time between, you know, the next two to or, or, or many weeks before that next check comes in. I know for me uh, in the past that has been troublesome with my car, given it's an older uh, make and model, an 05 uh, Hyundai. And, uh, you know, the maintenance fees go up on those things as they age. And uh, that can introduce a lot more stress into your life. But Dave, can help me get out of those situations. And Dave is not a person. Dave is a banking app that can get you $500 instantly with extra cash. There's no interest credit check needed. Millions have already downloaded Dave and you can too by going to the app store and download the Dave app. That's D-A-V-E. Sign up for an extra cash account and get $500 instantly. For terms and conditions, go to dave.com slash legal. Instant transfers fees apply. Banking provided by Evolve. Member FDIC. Your future you will thank you. So wrapping up today's episode, let's talk about the wide receiver spot where you have a player in Auden Tate who on last week's episode, breaking down my 53-man roster projection, I had Auden Tate making the practice squad rather than the roster, which I know several times where I've mentioned that uh, on Twitter as well as on the podcast over the last couple of months has surprised a lot of people where a lot of people sort of have assumed all along all off season since the Falcons added Auden Tate back in March that he was, you know, as good a chance, as good a lock to make the roster as any of the wide receivers outside of basically Drake London and probably Brian Edwards. And I think that's probably a little bit of a mistake largely due um, to, I think, a common mistake that you you find in your average Falcon fan. But we, of course, know all you locked on listeners aren't your so average Falcon fans. You're a little bit uh, you're, you're certainly above average because you have found uh, this great uh, podcast content. But, you know, I think the common mistake is uh, not to be overly condescending. But like I think a lot of fans think wide receivers are kind of created equal and not don't necessarily understand that there's kind of three different positions uh, among the wide receiver. You have an X receiver, you have a slot receiver, you have a Z receiver. We're not going to get into what distinguishes one from the other, but primarily we'll focus on the X position, uh, which was formerly filled by Julio Jones. And typically what you want in an X wide receiver is a guy that can regularly beat press. So typically you're looking for speed and or size at that position. Ideally, you can have both, which it was the case with Julio Jones. And it's, it's, funny because I used to constantly complain about the fact that, that the Falcons didn't have quality depth behind Julio Jones at that X wide receiver position uh, outside of 2016 with Aldrick Robinson and the 2017 2018 with Marvin Hall. That's part of the reason why I'm such a big Marvin Hall fan uh, if people are confused by that. Um, but now the seemingly issue that the Falcons have is they have an overabundance of X wide receivers uh, where you have Kyle Pitts who kind of filled those shoes half-heartedly last year, uh, given the Falcons didn't really have a replacement for Julio Jones. Obviously, they drafted Drake London this year, presumably because a lot of people feel like he can be an X wide receiver. And, you know, I would imagine if you didn't think that the Falcons didn't think highly of his ability to project as that X, um, they wouldn't have taking him in the top eight this past year. You also have Brian Edwards who filled those shoes with the Raiders last year in their uh, West Coast offense. And then you have Auden Tate, who was a backup to guys like A.J. Green and T. Higgins and Jamar Chase in Cincinnati at that X wide receiver position. But now I sit here and I go like, you don't need four of these guys. You only really kind of need two. Um, and that's part of the reason why I don't feel convinced that Auden Tate is as safe a bet to make the roster coupled with the fact that Auden Tate also doesn't have necessarily extensive experience on special teams. And you already know, you already have London and Edwards, two X receivers that probably won't be playing special teams this year. Do you really need to have three of those guys 
on the roster. Um, but, you know, I think one of the misconceptions people have when I project someone like an Auden Tate to maybe on the practice squad rather than having him on the roster is that I think he's bad. I'm a big fan of Auden Tate's game. And, you know, I think he's arguably the best contested catch receiver on the roster currently. And we'll see if, you know, Drake London or Brian Edwards can kind of dethrone him in that role. But I think ultimately it boils down to if not for the presences of players like Drake London and Brian Edwards, you'd probably be see, hearing me sing the praises of what Auden Tate potentially brings to the game uh, at that X wide receiver position. And certainly uh, a, a competent player that showed that in 2019 when he stepped in for an injured AJ Green and was a semi productive starter for the Bengals that season. And so, me, you know, not putting on Tate on my 53 man roster projection is not a knock against him. It's not meant to be a knock against him. I don't want him coming after me on Twitter like Anthony Rush did. Uh, it's just kind of, you know, the reason for all of this is to basically explain why he seemingly gets the short end of the stick, at least on this podcast and go to the aforementioned reasons. But I, I do think it's going to be hard for Auden Tate to stick over guys like London and Edwards uh, this year uh, in part, due to the fact that a big part of playing that X receiver role in this offense uh, is your ability to get yards after catch, right? And a lot of what Arthur Smith does is, you know, run those intermediate dig routes, those in-breaking routes uh, over the middle. And ideally your X wide receiver can turn a 12 yard dig into a 20 or 30 yard gain. That's what he had in um, AJ Brown. That's what obviously we saw Julio Jones do that for, you know, years and years here in Atlanta. That's ideally what you're getting in this X wide receiver position at that position. And when I say, when I sit here and I stack this current group of guys, whether we're talking about London, Edwards or, or Tate, you know, I kind of put Tate at the bottom of that because while he's an elite contested catch guy due to his size and physicality, he's not necessarily known as a great yak guys, particularly compared to guys like London. London's not the fastest guy, but we know London has a physical uh, streak in his game uh, and will fight for those extra yards. We broke that down in his scouting report. And we know that Brian Edwards has a similar physicality to his game and also brings probably a little bit more juice uh, than London, as well as Tate does. Uh, again, Tate ran a four, six, eight, uh, 40 time. And so that's not really a, a type of skill set that's really conducive uh, to turning those 12 yard gains into big plays after the catch, because he's not going to necessarily be running away from defenders. And we saw that throughout his time uh, in Cincinnati, that he's more of a possession receiver. And so obviously I, I think a lot of people look at Tate's value as more of a red zone threat, but it's going to be harder for him to get on the field and overtake guys like London and Tate. I mean, London and Edwards and Pitts and, and Ferkser and all these other guys uh, just to basically trot him out there for a handful of red zone plays every single week. So, you know, Tate kind of fits the similar dynamic as McGarry, as a Fetty, as Rush, as well as so many other players on this Falcons roster that are entering contract years or signed one year contracts that they're fighting for their NFL futures. Uh, that, you know, the dynamic was you come to Atlanta, you'll get playing opportunities here, given some question marks of the overall talent of this roster, that you'll have better opportunities to showcase what you can bring uh, at this NFL level here in Atlanta than you could elsewhere. And, you know, that will lead to either you having that sort of breakout type of season. Uh, and if you can do that, you will get paid by somebody next offseason. And unlike this past offseason, where the Falcons couldn't necessarily afford to do that outside of maybe Cordero Patterson, Next offseason, when the Falcons are probably swimming in cap space, 50, 60 million dollars, current projections are saying, um, you know, they'll be able to afford to pay some of these guys coming out the contract. That was one of the reasons why I was so high on the Eddie Goldman signing as another one of these one year sort of contracts. And so we'll sort of see if Auden Tate can sort of uh, defy those expectations. Again, he's a bubble player for me. But whoever winds up being that primary X wide receiver in his offense, and I think it'll be a split between Drake London and Brian Edwards. I think, you know, it'll be Drake London when the Falcons are using two wide receiver sets. But then when they go to three wide receiver sets, you probably will see Drake London li lining up in the slot and Brian Edwards uh, getting those reps at that X wide receiver. And then whoever else, whether it's Demir Bird or Lamada Zacchaeus, also being in the mix, as well as combinations of two wide receivers, whereas Edwards in London and Maybe you see London be more the Z wide receiver and Edwards be the X wide receiver. But again, Auden Tate can certainly throw his hat into the rink uh, and make a name for himself. And this summer, he has a golden opportunity and the best opportunity he's going to have because he's not going to have, uh, or at least, you know, 
outside of Drake London, he's not going to have this, you know, AJ Green, Jamar Chase, you know, generational talent type of wide receiver uh, starting ahead of him. No offense to Drake London, but, you know, I don't see him as a generational talent, nor should I think anybody else should see him in that light. But maybe he proves me wrong in that regard. But so this is a golden opportunity for Auden Tate to sort of showcase what he has. And of course, we also know injuries do happen uh, in not only in the summer, but also in the regular season. So that may be an avenue for him to get more opportunities opportunities on the football field. So we'll see if, you know, Auden Tate can turn himself from a bubble player, as I'm currently looking at him, to a breakout potential type of guy uh, by the time we get to the end of the summer or years in. So that's one of the, that's wrapping up today's episode. Does want to talk about some of these guys that are quote unquote on the bubble, uh, but also have breakout potential because they're playing for their NFL futures. And I think these players will be highly motivated. To me, the the question isn't whether these players are going to be motivated to put their best foot forward this year. It's going to be whether or not this coaching staff, particularly on the offense side of the ball, will be able to guide them um, to have that sort of success this season. And we'll just sort of see how it all plays out, guys. And tomorrow we'll be joined by Dave Choate of the Falcoholic. I'm tinkering with an idea of doing a live show uh, on Monday evening on YouTube at 8 p.m. Eastern time uh, uh, to with Dave Choate to talk more about, you know, some of his stories, thoughts and storylines heading into training camp. But uh, by all means, let me know in the comments if you would love to see a live show. We don't do too many live uh, episodes uh, where we can sort of react uh, to the chat and all those various things on YouTube. So uh, let me know in the comments if you have any feedback on doing that. And we may do some more of that uh, over the course of this summer as we get geared up for the regular season with the Falcons. Uh, and of course, you can always provide your feedback elsewhere via Twitter or Facebook at Locked on Falcons. You can send an email to Locked on Falcons at mail.com as well. So tomorrow we'll be back with Dave Choate of the Falcoholic guys, and we'll sort of get his thoughts on maybe some breakout players as well as some bubble players in that regard, guys. Uh, but that will do it for us here. Make sure you check out Locked on NFL as potentially your second listen, as well as Locked On Sports Atlanta, Locked On Braves, Locked On Hawks, Locked On Bulldogs, uh, as well as the other local sports shows in your preferred uh, second listen on the Locked On Podcast Network on all the same podcast platforms that you're currently listening and or watching Locked On Falcons. Appreciate it, guys. Till then.